looking into Acts chapter 15, Christian unity. It's a good thing to get along with other people, isn't it? I don't know about you, but I just don't like to fuss and feud and fight. I don't like a church that has factions and friction. <laughs> I'm a woodworker as a hobby. I used to do it for a living. But as a hobby, the one thing I've learned about sandpaper is it creates friction. <laughs> Amen. But sometimes the Lord has to take and use the sandpaper on us to whittle us down a, a, a little bit so that we learn to get along. Amen? Amen? Amen. So we're talking this morning about Acts. We go back into Acts chapter 10 where Peter is instructed by the Lord to go to the house of Cornelius. Cornelius was a Gentile. He was a Roman centurion. And for Peter to go into his home was off limits. Peter raised a good Jew, was told, don't associate with those there Gentiles. But the Lord confronts Peter and is prejudiced, and the Lord says, don't ever say to me of anything that I make is unclean. Now, you know that what happened to Peter that afternoon was he fell asleep, he was on the roof, a sheet came down from heaven, had all kinds of critters in it, and the Lord said, Peter, you're hungry, eat. And Peter said, oh, no, no, no. And the Lord three times finally said, Peter, I told you to eat. And so the Lord says to him then, don't ever say what I've made is unclean. And that included the Gentiles. That included Cornelius. Now, God has a plan. God's plan included the Gentiles. But you know what's funny about us? Sometimes we don't think God knows what he's doing. Sometimes we think exactly that. God's plan creates problems for us. Oh my goodness. Yes, he does. You see what had happened, some of the Jewish believers, they said, we, we are God's special people. And because we're God's special people, God belongs to us. Oh, really? That's what they thought. You know, sometimes we get to thinking we're pretty special and that we can pretty much put limits on God. Shake your head like this and say with me, no way. We don't do that. Neither could the Jews. Gentiles, they said, needed to become Jewish. And so the question was, could a Gentile believer become a Christian without becoming Jewish first? That was a big question in the early church. And so some strict Jews said, no, we don't associate with Jews. We don't eat with them. We don't even do business with them. And so if they want to be part of the Christian church, they have to be Jewish first. Now, that was a problem. The good thing about problems is there's always a solution. Always a solution. And this problem needed a solution. So it wasn't an easy fix, but they took and they did what every church does. They formed a committee. It's called the Council of Jerusalem, and we'll get to that in a little bit. Now, in Jerusalem, there was a problem. So, Houston, we have a problem. You can't be a Christian unless, huh? Who said that one? Well, we'll find out. Paul and Barnabas, they've been out ministering to the Gentiles. They've been on a, a mission tour for about two years. Now, primarily, they would go into town. They would go to a Jewish synagogue, kind of set up a little camp and start praying. But then they ministered to not only Jews, but also to Gentiles. And a lot of people, Jews and Gentiles, came to know the Lord. Amen? Amen. 
Isn't that what it's all about? It is. So, on the way to Jerusalem, they tell how the Gentiles had been converted, and this news made all the believers who heard it what? Oh, we're happy in Jesus. Amen. Amen. So, they were welcomed by the church because God had included them too. However, back in Jerusalem, there were some Christian Pharisees who said, oh, no, 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 no. They can't be Christian unless, unless they do what we think they ought to do. Now, folks, I hate to tell you that I have been in the church for a long, long time. I have heard some strange things about who could and who couldn't be a Christian. Let me tell you a few examples. Can I indulge on you? Well, if you shop, eat, buy, purchase, go out to a restaurant on Sunday, say it with me, you can't be a Christian. Now, if you're a man and you have long hair, I've heard this, you have facial hair, if you have a tattoo, you wear spiffy clothes, whatever it is. I even hesitated to use the word spiffy. Some of you don't even know what spiffy means. <laughs> but if you have any of that and you're a man, say it with me. You can't be a Christian. If you're a lady and you cut your hair or wear your hair a certain way, you wear makeup, you wear jewelry, you take and you have tattoos or whatever, say it with me. You can't be a Christian unless, unless you change and make yourself like us. Now, none of you have ever heard these things, have you? Oh, really? Well, you can't be a Christian unless you take, and especially if you own a nice car, a nice house, you own nice things, nice clothes, nice whatever. If you own anything nice, you can't be a Christian. I have heard this before. <laughs> well, it sounds like a bad rendition of Jeff Foxworthy. Am I right? Say amen. amen. Now, I remember Lynette as a ninth grader. She was in Michigan. I actually called her the other day. I said, do I have the facts straight that you were about eighth or ninth grade? She said I was in the ninth grade. She goes up to Michigan. She's spending time with her grandparents and... Uh, Debbie's mom and dad wanted to go to their local camp meeting. And Lynette comes bebopping out, and they say, you can't wear those shorts to our camp. What's wrong with my shorts? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. You, you can't wear shorts to our camp. You have to wear a dress. And she had to scrounge around. She said, find a dress. And uh, the thing of it is, Lynette had been going to Nazarene camps all of her life. But this was no Nazarene camp. This was a holiness camp. Now, there's a big difference in a Nazarene camp and a holiness camp, even though the Church of Nazarene is a holiness group. <laughs> Somebody say amen. <laughs> this was a holiness camp. And Lynette said, and I always relish the fact when my children have a new experience. <laughs> and she came home, she said, I want to tell you, Mom and Dad, there were some strange things that happened at that camp. And we laughed, and I said, hey, Toto, we're not in Kansas anymore. <laughs> oh, I had to laugh. But anyway... The Antioch church, where Paul and Barnabas had been, they were a very progressive church. Progressive in the sense that they didn't care if you were Jew or Gentile. They were very accepting of the brothers, the sisters, the Jews, the non-Jews. They were accepting. But... 
back in Jerusalem, not everybody was happy. And so what they did, they said, you can't come into the church unless you become Jewish first. Now, it was unthinkable to Paul and Barnabas. It was unthinkable to the church at Antioch. And so they head off to Jerusalem. And they disagreed. And they said, let's go and help settle the problem. So they go to Jerusalem. And there in Jerusalem, they ask the question, is Christ salvation for everybody or is it just for a number of people, a little small group of people? Us four and no more. Say that with me. Us four and no more. You know, we can get to the point where we do that. Oh, you want to be a part of our church? You want to be a part of our group? You know, because it's only us four and no more. And we're special people. We're God's special people. And because we're God's special people, we have God in our hip pocket. We can pull him out like a set of car keys. Huh? Am I making this up? I've seen it. We try to put him in a box. We try to restrict his grace. We only say, well, God's grace is only for this group of people. And it's wrong. Thank you. And we try to limit who can be saved and who can't. You're saved, you're saved, you're saved. You're not, you're not, and you are going to H-E double hockey sticks. Have you heard that before? Oh, yeah. yeah. You're acceptable if you are a certain class, a certain education level, a certain economic level, a certain skin tone, a certain language, a certain this, a certain that, and the list goes on and on and on. And what happens in a church or a group of people that do that is they called what's building the fort. They build the four walls, and they say to everybody that's in the wall, you're part of the group, and nobody else who's on the outside can get into our little group. But then after a while, they're not happy even with the people who are in the group, and so they start making more rules. And you can't be a Christian unless you change and you become like we are. Well, Peter, he, he's back in Jerusalem, and he He's there at the church, and Peter, for some odd reason or another, after Pentecost, he's filled with the Holy Spirit, and he speaks with boldness. And so he talks up. He says, wait a second, here's my good friend Cornelius, Roman centurion, eh, that's strike one, Gentile, eh, strike two. Plus, Peter says, well, in fact, I stayed in the home of Simon the Tanner. (laughs) You can see all these Pharisaical Christians going nuts. (laughs) Have you ever saw somebody really spiritual go nuts on you? It's actually funny because they say, oh, you can't be a Christian unless. So, see, Peter says, well, God knows all of our hearts. You see, God accepted us and God accepted them. God has filled them with the Holy Spirit, and God has filled us with the Holy Spirit. So in other words, God is saying, I was once prejudiced, Peter says, I was once prejudiced, but God changed me, and the thing that I've learned about God is he doesn't discriminate against anybody. Everybody ought to say amen. amen. Because the last time I looked, every last one of us looked different. Aren't you glad for that? Yeah. Boy, I would, I would absolutely feel sorry for the person that looked like me. I'd say, uh, thank you, Lee. <laughs> Peter says, this is what's happened. Our hearts have been purified by faith in the Son of God, and it's not by what we do or our works. Say Amen. So, are we going to question God? This is a question that Peter says. Are we going to question God? Do you have the audacity to question God? If so, step up, because the rest of us are going to move away. There might be a little thunderstorm moving in. (laughs) 
and lightning may strike. He says, no, we don't question God. We believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just like they are. So now you have Paul and Barnabas who disagree with these crazy people. (laughs) Peter stands up. He disagrees with the crazy people. And so they share about how God is bringing all of the Gentiles into the church, which is a good thing. Because if not, you and I wouldn't be here today. Now, years ago, there was an expression. How many remember the commercial? When E.F. Hutton speaks, everybody listens. And then they would show restaurant scenes and everything. Everybody, when they'd say E.F. Hutton, everything, silent. At the Jerusalem Council, I can only imagine, there was this guy by the name of James who speaks up and everybody listens. Well, just who does James think he is? Well, he's only the brother of Jesus. (laughs) I think that would hold just a little bit of credibility, don't you? He's also one of the only individuals that Jesus personally came to and spoke with after the resurrection on his own. Plus the fact that he's kind of like the pastor of the Jerusalem church. Now, I don't know about you, but every now and then, you know, when there might be something going on in the church, every now and then they come and ask the pastor. (laughs) I'm not sure I'm like James. When the pastor speaks, everybody listens. (laughs) I don't think it happens that way. But with James, it did. So James says, listen, here's what happened. God first first intervened to choose a people for his name. Who are the people for his name? The Jews. But they came from the Gentiles. James says, listen, when when God started all of this, he worked through a Gentile. Read your Old Testament, folks. It's all there. James, pretty smart guy. He says, that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles, who bear my name, says the Lord. So James is saying, God's not only working through quote, unquote, the chosen people, God's working through anybody he well wants to. Amen. So, he says we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles because what what are they doing? They're turning to God. You know what? It's a great thing is when anybody tries to turn to God, we should do our absolute best to help them to get to Jesus. Amen. So, they don't need to be Jewish to be Christian. No, they don't have to go through all the ritual, and you can read what they were requiring. However, he says, you know, to some people, their old way of life was very offensive, and it was. So James says, but you know, if they follow God's universal laws, and they won't offend God, but instead what they're going to do is they're going to make God happy. So James says, you know, I've been led by the Holy Spirit. I'm going to make some recommendations. And here's what he boil, it boils down to. He said, number one, try to abstain from food that's been offered to idols because, number one, idols offend God. They always have been offensive to God. God says, I don't like idols, and you're not to bow down to any idol. That's even applicable today, isn't it? But see, back then, what they would do is they would take meat and so forth and offer it to idols, and God says, I don't want any part of that. So don't pollute yourself, Christian, by eating meat that's been offered to an idol. Number two, abstain from sexual immorality. Now, the one thing that we understand about Roman society, no rules. When it came to their sexuality, there were no rules, no boundaries, James says, wait a second, though. God's universal law is purity. 
Here's why. Because God said it then, he meant it in Jerusalem council, and he means it today. A man shall leave his father and his mother and is united with his wife. And they will become one flesh. So Christians are to be pure in an impure world. Amen? So this honored God who created man for his wife and a wife for her husband. Thank you. Don't get confused that God's changed his mind about all of this. I got one amen. Lee, say it again. God's not confused. Society's all messed up. You can marry your dog if you want to. You can go out and marry your horse. Do you see where society takes a beautiful thing that God makes and absolutely defiles and it becomes absolutely horrible? Stay with me now. So, James says, abstain from sexual immorality. He's also, stay away from meat that's been strangled and from blood. Why? Because blood was life and all life belonged to God. And God says back in the book of Genesis, he says, everything that lives and moves will be food for you. He said, just as I gave you green plants. Now listen. Listen. I gave you the salad, I gave you the potatoes and the carrots. Now I'm going to let you have some meat. Now, you line me up for a 22-ounce ribeye. Oh, baby. You must not eat the meat that has lifeblood in it. In other words, you've got to let, it, the, let the blood drain out. So James says, here's what, don't eat the blood, drain the blood out, and then... Let's eat kosher. <laughs> I thought that would be a good joke. I love corned beef. <laughs> I'm striking up, Brother Carl. The kosher joke didn't get it. The corned beef didn't get it. Bacon. <laughs> so what, what is James doing here? James is recommending to the council conciliatory ideas for the new believers that are coming in. And no one gives any kind of opposing reason or fusses or even takes and quibbles about these prohibitions. Nobody does. Why? Because you have the authority of Paul and Barnabas and Peter and now James, and they're all saying, what are we doing all this for? We're trying to win people to Jesus. We don't want to offend anybody, but we don't want to take and have everybody to think that they're coming into the Christian church and they got to be Jewish first. So leave away the pagan part of life and Christians were no longer pagans. I want to emphasize something right now. We are not pagans. Don't buy into all the nonsense of the world thinking that you can do this, that, and the other and you're still covered by God's grace. God loves you. He accepts you. But he is a transforming God to bring you out of darkness into light. Amen. <clears throat> out of impurity into purity. Amen. Amen. So, follow God's laws and you won't offend each other. You won't offend, you won't even offend God. So these confessions, they impacted the New Testament church for their witness of God and for the betterment of the church. You see, sometimes life is full of what we would call give and take. Last time I knew that's what marriage was last time I knew that's what raising children was all about last time I knew when you're an employer and you try to get along with your employees there's a lot of give and take you see even in the New Testament church 
They came together in the Jerusalem council for a lot of give and take. So this all shows up. What shows up? Well, it shows up, and Paul and Peter and the other New Testament writers, they all came to the conclusion there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. Say glory to God, because most of us are in the Gentile group. <laughs> Amen. So there was a problem, but to every problem there is a solution. I like solutions, don't you? Amen. Now, sometimes solutions are hard to come by. It's not always easy to sit down with a pack of people and discuss things and come to a resolution, but that's the, pro that's the great thing about problems. There's always a solution. And love is a give and take. Because we love each other, in any relationship, there's always give and take. When you dig your heels into the sand and say, if you don't play the game my way, I'm taking my ball home with me. There's not a whole lot of love and give and take, is there? Here's the thing about love and concessions. Out of a concession, there comes love and there comes unity there comes peace, and in the church, there comes partnerships. Because, do you know the church is not all about me, and it's not all about you? It's all about God. So you and I understand, concessions cause the church to impact the world then, and you and I have the opportunity to impact the world today. So that's why we try to get along with each other. Amen? That's a good thing, right? Amen. So you have to ask yourself, am I willing to change? Well, Paul was, Barnabas was, Peter certainly did. I'm not sure about James, but James probably had a few things to work through, as did some of the other Christians. But when God directs you, God's, God's wisdom helps make the right kind of changes in your life. Amen? So, will you and I give concessions to each other? Can you and I will willingly yield up what we want for the betterment of the kingdom of God? We must. Amen? And do you want God to change you? That's the big question. Do you want God to change you? God spoke to Peter three times. Till finally it got, got through to him. Okay, I'll accept Cornelius. Okay. Now, Peter, years later, he's in Jerusalem and he's defending the Christian faith. God has included Jews and Gentiles. You and I have to ask this, ourselves this question. God, am I willing to let you change me? The message this morning is about Christian unity. Praise team, would you come? We're going to sing and open the altar up this morning for prayer. We are one in the bond of love. We are one in the bond of love. We have joined our spirits with the Spirit of God. We are one in the bond of love. Do you know what love's going to do in a church? It'll bring us together. Do you know what love will do in your marriage? It'll bring you and your wife together. It'll bring you and your husband closer together. Do you know what love does with your children and your grandchildren? It'll bring you closer. See, that's what love is all about. It's a lot of give and take. But we're one in the bond of love. Now, I don't know if you want to pray about anything. If you've got something going on in your life, that's what this place of prayer is all about. Maybe you say, you know, I've kind of let some things maybe slip in my life, and I'm not as conciliatory as I ought to be. In fact, instead of being willing to change, I've kind of dug my heels in the sand, and I want to change. Then that's what this place of prayer is all about. Nobody's going to judge you. 
If you've never met Jesus and ask him into your heart, today's your day. You can come and stand here as we pray and say, Dear Lord Jesus, I want you to come into my heart. I want you to change my life. Let's stand together and as we sing this beautiful chorus, come and gather around the family altar for a closing prayer.